Hi. Hi. Welcome to Disrupting Death. I'm Kathy Cordes Miller. And I'm Carrie Lynn Durant. So great you could join us today. I can't believe, Carrie Lynn, we are finally getting this baby off the ground. Our ideas, our questions, our desires to dig a little bit deeper into medical assistance in dying and what does it mean for us and conversations with those people who know it deeply. That brings us to our very first guest and I am super excited that she agreed to be our first guest. If I had the capacity to do a drum roll for you right now, I would do so. Exactly. A drum roll would be great and that would be appropriate for our first guest. Okay, I have to fangirl and gush a little bit because I have wanted to be able to sit and interview our first guest for a long time. I remember reading her book, A Good Death, way back when medical assistance in dying was just coming onto my awareness, but also I would say more awareness within the Canadian context. And people were beginning to really have some questions and thoughts and wonder what this would all look like. And our first guest, was leading the way as an esteemed reporter, as a writer, as a critical lens on Canada. She was piecing our history together so that we could reflect back on that and understand how we got here. Well, I think, Kathy, you should put our listeners out of the suspense we're all hanging on to. Who are we going to get to talk to today? Of course, we are talking about the Sandra Martin. Sandra Martin is the author of the great book called A Good Death. And I remember how nervous I was when I reached out when my book was getting published and I asked Sandra if she would do a blurb about my book. And that's how we first connected. And then a couple of years ago, when we were engaging in some knowledge translation from our first study, the untold stories of medical assistance in dying in Ontario, we got to ask Sandra if she would keynote our online research symposium. I was so excited. And really, we know people showed up to that research symposium to hear Sandra. Well, I think without further ado, we should get this conversation started. All right. I can't wait to welcome Sandra. I have to just be super honest that I was so excited when you agreed to do this because I so appreciated you keynoting at our research symposium a couple of years ago. And so just to have the opportunity to speak with you again is just great. I want to say thank you so much because most people don't think I'm an expert, which I'm not. I'm a journalist. So I was really very flattered that you asked me to speak because I'm not usually asked to speak. I'm asked to speak to groups of people and maybe to talk about books and stuff like that. But at a academic symposium, I am like nowhere in the room. I actually ask if I can be in the room. So I was very flattered. I think that's one of the things that's wrong with academia is that we need to make information accessible to people and we need to recognize that so-called experts and i use that in air quotes of course look and feel in different ways and one of the things i appreciate about being a qualitative researcher is that the experts are the people with lived experience the expert are the people out doing that and you literally wrote the book on medical assistance and dying in canada and i consult it regularly and pull it out and think about how far we've come and how far we have yet to be and how, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. I get a little bit nervous when I think about some of the layers and maybe some of the complexities. So I'm grateful to have this discussion with someone who I do think is an expert in made in Canada. Thank you. What I'm really interested in, Sandra, is how did you move from being known as Canada's most eloquent obituary writer to writing about made? I think that all journalists are curious. It's the way you learn things. It's the what gets you up in the morning. And I was primarily someone who wrote about books and arts and culture. But I wanted to do something different. And the Globe and Mail had had an obituary writer who died. And then they didn't replace that person. So they had an obituary editor and they thought they should have a writer at some point. I think it was around 2004. And I thought, 
you know what? No one's going to want that job because it's supposed to be the graveyard of journalism. You know, you don't get credit. The people, if you write it in advance, they never die. It's just, it was just not a good place to be breaking news and so on. But I didn't really care about breaking news so much. I wanted to write about people. So I said, hey, I'll do that job. And I was, I don't know how many other people applied, perhaps nobody. So I got the job. And I started writing lives. And then it was, of course, I was having to do it on incredible deadline pressure. And it wasn't just literary people. It was all sorts of other people. So I was continuing to learn things. And I enjoyed that very much. Um, the pressure was like, Ooh, but, you know, I guess I like pressure. Um, give me a deadline and I'll do it. Anyway, I think one of my first big obituaries, just almost shortly after I started, was Pierre Burton. One of the things about obituaries, you have to set people in their context. And I was beginning to read about people who were dying in different ways. I mean, they weren't waiting. And some of them were very brave. And most of them were women. Ruth Goodman was one who had been an activist all her life, had campaigned for abortion rights. And she had moved with her family from the United States to Canada because she had two sons and she wanted to avoid the draft for the Vietnam War. She was an activist. And how was she going to end her life? There was no law to allow this. I had to be very, very careful the way I wrote about it. Was there anybody in the room? What happened? Because it was a criminal offense. And so I found this interesting. And I wrote about a number of people like that carefully. And then there were these two movements afoot. They decided that in Quebec, the criminal code didn't really apply in this instance because healthcare was a provincial matter, not a federal matter. So they could do their end of life legislation without having to go through the Canadian government, the federal criminal code, which prohibited assisting a suicide. And at the same time, more or less the same time, there was a movement in British Columbia the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association to bring another challenge to the Supreme Court to the criminal code prohibition against assisting a suicide. So there were those two movements on either side of the country. And that there were people who were in terrible straits and who wanted to challenge the law, but really didn't know how to do it except by dying by their own hand and leaving notes or asking for somebody to write about them. So one of the people I wrote about was Kim Teske. I don't know if you remember her, but oh, such an incredible story. Her father had died of testicular cancer when he was about 40. And he left her mother as a widow with six children. Now, because the father had testicular cancer, they didn't know that he had Huntington's, which is one of the worst neurological diseases because it includes symptoms of Alzheimer's and um, movement disorders and psychosis. I mean, it is a terrible disease and it's genetic. So if you one of your parents has it, there's a 50% chance you are going to get it. So of the six children, three of them tested positive for Huntington's. And the first one was the eldest son who was 40, who nobody knew at the time, that that's what he had. It took a long time to learn. And so after that, it turned out that Kim, the middle sister, also had Huntington's. And she did not want to end up like her brother, unable to feed herself. They always kept talking about wanting to wipe their own bums. You know, I don't know whether how important it is, but it was important to them. It was a sign of their independence. So Kim wanted to die. And she didn't want to do anything violent. And the one thing she decided was that she was going to stop eating and drinking until she died. And so when she approached Dying with Dignity, um, a grassroots organization that has been a, a stalwart in terms of human rights, in terms of helping people learn about their options, not in helping people die. So Kim had gone to them. And they had contacted me and probably other journalists, I don't know. And I said, oh, that's an interesting story. And so I wrote it. But in the Teske family, these six kids, all grown up, some of whom had already had children when they learned that their older brother had Huntington's. So some of them probably had acquired the disease. Um, passed it along. And passed it along. And but they didn't know. Some of them were being tested. Some of them weren't being tested. It's a big decision because once you're tested, what do you do with it? Because mm -hmm. there's no cure. So Kim had two really strong sisters and a terrific mother. And 
they weren't going to tell anybody. They were just going to do it quietly. And she was going to stop eating and drinking. And one of her sisters was a nurse. So that was going to help. No doctor would help her. No doctor at all, including her own family doctor. And what they realized after they got in touch with the Globe and we were going to do this story, I was going to write it. Someone else was going to do photographs that if this was going to appear in the national newspaper, they better tell their siblings. Because yes. that yeah. was going to be, yeah. oh, that's big. <laughs> that's yeah. big. And those are things that we don't really think about. I mean, one of the things about medical assistance and dying is you don't have to tell your family. Right. But there are repercussions for not telling your family. I mean, yes. it's not good. I think it's, I think transparency is important. Anyway, because they realized that their siblings were going to read the paper one day and say, oh my gosh, they decided to tell their siblings. And as a result, all the siblings got involved. I mean, they were shocked, some of them. They were not accepting, they were helpful, but it meant that that family, they became much, much closer and they celebrated Kim's life and her mm. death in a way that was quite moving, I thought. And her death was quite peaceful. It wasn't in the shadows. It wasn't violent. It took, um, I think, 12 days. And so I was writing about all these people. And then at some point, a publisher approached me and asked me if I wanted to write a book about end of life. And I sensibly said no, because I knew that it was going to be like daily journalism, because it was moving so fast. In Quebec, they're already starting to put their legislation through the House. And in BC, they're going through the three levels of the court system. So, you know, this is all happening too fast. And then the publisher came back to me and I said, mm, well, I'll do an outline. So I did an outline and then I decided, okay. And I talked to my agent and yes, a proposal. And so I agreed to do it. So as I was writing this book, the Supreme Court brought down its decision and it was a beautifully written, eloquent decision in which it was about patience and it was about reconciling the conscientious rights of both doctors and patients. What the Supreme Court said was that the government of the day, if it so chose, had one year in which to table legislation. Otherwise, the Supreme Court decision was going to stand in the same way that it does with abortion. We don't have an abortion law, as you know. Yeah. All of this was pretty exciting. So here's what happened on a personal level for me. On the day of my book launch, that was the day that the Liberal government tabled its legislation on what became Bill C-14, Medical Assistance in Dying. That was the day. And to tell you the truth, I knew that day that my book wasn't finished. And I remember making a speech at my book launch and saying, this is not over. This is just the beginning. And being kind of, you know, forthright. And at that same book launch, a very senior editor at the Globe said, you've got to write a story tomorrow. I said, oh, are you kidding me? And he said, no, you've got to write a story. So I did write a story about what this meant and how the bill was not about suffering. It was about dying. And that was different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I really want to broach something with you at this point, while it's kind of fresh in our conversation here, you mentioned in that article about Kim in the Globe that your senior editor asked you, do you have the stomach for such a story? You go on to say in that article that it's not the strong stomach, it's the open heart. And I love that. Can you talk a little bit about how that open heart has guided you in these explorations of medical assistance and dying? Yeah. It's funny. This particular editor who didn't remember that conversation, so it became a little awkward, but he had asked me sometime before I had agreed to write the book or any of that stuff, if I would write about someone who was dying and did I have the stomach for it? But it's not about the stomach. It's about the heart. It's about these pieces. And I had these people's lives. I mean, these are these are sad, sad lives. And I had learned so much. I remember a woman saying, I let him die because I loved him. Mm 
And that's really what it's about. And it reminded me of so many things that came out of my fingertips when I was writing that book. So Kim Teske was only one example. There were many others. And there were people who botched it, people who thought they knew what they were doing. I mean, there was one situation where there was a doctor and his wife, and he was going to do the self-exit, blah, blah, blah. You know, these guys, sorry. And he screwed it up. He forgot that she was on painkillers, so he didn't have enough opiates for her to die. And so he ended up on life support, and she ended up in a series of institutions for the next couple of years till she died. So it was like, what is the lesser harm? Giving someone the right to die or having that person die violently or in the shadows or go without food and drink for 12 days. So this is what I meant about heart, about being open to listening to their stories. And I learned so much in those conversations. And it was a fascinating thing to do, frankly. Yeah. I kind of think I should have put it behind me, but I haven't. <laughs> we're we're grateful you haven't put it behind you. And I know having read a fair bit of your writing in the past referred to that maybe you sort of called your book a history of cruel choices as oh, opposed yeah. to a good death. Can you tell me more about that? Why do you think that that's the case? Well, because for Sue Rodriguez, for example, I mean, yeah. she says, who owns my body? Whose body is this? And it, it's the cruel choice. I mean... I don't think any of us really wants to to die. So what is the choice? And it's a choice of ending my life and getting rid of this struggle, this pain, this suffering that's intolerable to me or waiting it out. And I guess I just had met so many people and listened to them. And of course, your own life comes into it too. I remember my mother's death, which still haunts me because it was so horrible. And I think that's what's caused a lot of people to get involved in this movement because they've seen the suffering of others. There was this man called Austin Bastable, who was the first person to go to see Jack Kevorkian in the United mm-hmm. States and have an assisted yeah. death there. And he had tried to end his life at some point. And his wife discovered him and called 911. So he was in hospital. And three days later, she's visiting him in hospital. And she says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But that's what we're like. We're human beings. You know, I'm wandering a bit, but I want to tell you that I interviewed Atul Gawande. He was not in favor of assisted dying, but he wrote this very important book called Being Mortal. Mortal, yeah. And in that book, he talks about his parents. His mother is a doctor. His father is a doctor. He clearly is a doctor. He used to write a lot of stuff for the New Yorker. He's a very good writer, and he's just a very important voice. And so he describes this situation in which his father has a particular kind of cancer. It's a cancer of the spinal cord, and it's very painful. And he said, I don't want pain. I don't want this. And so they had visits with a hospice nurse, as it's called in the United States. They had the piece of yellow paper on the refrigerator, do not resuscitate, et cetera, et cetera. And then one morning, Atul Gawande's father wakes up and he can't breathe. And Atul Gawande's mother, a doctor, calls 911 or whatever the equivalent is in the United States. And so as delicately as I could, I said to Atul Gawande when I'm interviewing him, I say, why did your mother do that? Because it was agreed. Everybody knew what the plan was. And he said, because we weren't acting like doctors, we were acting like family. And that's what people do. You think maybe this is temporary. Maybe this can be fixed. And of course, It can't be fixed, which is why you need open conversations and you need access to your family doctor, which is a real problem in this country nowadays. Oh, massive and getting worse. Yes. And so that's why I was thinking I should have called it cruel choices because so many people have had to make those decisions. Now it's getting better. It's getting better, but there are still some problems. I mean, as you know, as well as I do, the original medical assistance and dying bill was really, really vested in protecting the vulnerable. 
yeah. protecting the vulnerable. So it meant that people had to have their natural deaths to be reasonably foreseeable. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> it went through a long process of little challenges here, there, and everywhere mm -hmm. to try and figure out what it meant to have a reasonably foreseeable natural death. And slowly that was chipped away. For example, Audrey Parker in Halifax, she had metastasized breast cancer and she knew she was going to die. And she wanted one last Christmas before she was going to have medically assisted death. And the problem for her was she learned that the cancer had spread to her brain. And so she was afraid because at that point, under the old law, you had to affirm consent at the last minute. Right. And that was very good for doctors because they knew when they were talking to a patient, are you sure this is really what you want? And the patient said yes or no. So that was an assurance for the doctor that this was patient-centered care. Yeah. But the problem was that some people who were so close to dying, because most of the people who have an assisted death or have cancer. And <clears throat> so at the end stage, should they be going off their pain medication so they can be lucid enough to affirm consent? Or do they get denied at the last minute because they're no longer lucid because they're on their pain medication? So these were yeah. problems. And Audrey Parker had her death before she needed to, which was against everything that I believe is right in terms of the patient having the autonomy and the mm. right to decide yeah. when enough is enough. Mm. So she died in November, missing Christmas. So she would be lucid enough to affirm. Yeah. Consent. And so that became part of this movement to decide that reasonably foreseeable natural death was something that, first of all, doctors should be deciding, not law courts. And second, that if the law was amended with Audrey's amendment and the new law, which Lametti put through, would change things to a two-tier system. The people who were clearly dying, who could have a waiver of final consent. Set. And there were the other people who weren't dying quite so quickly. And so they were in a second tier, but they could move up into the first tier if their disease became more obvious or more blessing or whatever, and they could sign a waiver of final consent. Okay. And that is the law as we have it now, but there's still some issues, of course. Yes, there are. But the other point I want to make, there was a woman whose name we only know as EF. Her primary problem was she had a severe mental illness and she applied to the court of Queens bench in Alberta and got permission to have an assisted death. Now, I think this is really important in terms of what is happening now today with mental illness. Mental illness as of March 17th, 2023 was supposed to be allowed under our current made legislation. There's been so much fuss about this that David Lametti, the justice minister has said, we're gonna hold off on that for a while. We're going to have a conversation. Now, Parliament isn't sitting as we talk today, early in January 2023. So we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. But I want to say personally that I feel mental illness is a very difficult one, but I don't think it should be impossible. But it is difficult because mm -hmm. it's a mental illness, not a physical illness, usually. And the situation with the woman who applied for an assisted death, who had a mental illness, it manifested itself in physical ways. Now, I yes. am not a judge, so I don't know whether that was a factor. But it is certainly true that we seem to have forgotten that under the Supreme Court decision and the ruling that it was possible for somebody who had a mental illness to actually have a legal assisted death. And that was in 2016. Yeah. Hmm. I think what's so interesting is there are so many unknowns, right? And then I think it goes back to the whole issue of what constitutes intractable pain. Is existential pain same as pain that is physiologically manifested? I don't know. There's so many question marks around the whole thing. And I think one of the things that's important to remember too is that 
one of the reasons that we had a change in the law, which is the law that came into being in 2021, the made law, was because two people in Quebec, Nicole Gladieu and Jean Truchon, both of whom had serious physical illnesses. He had spasmodic cerebral palsy that was yep. um, aggressive. She had post-polio syndrome. And they challenged the reasonably foreseeable natural death in a Quebec court. Now, there was the pandemic. There were all sorts of things. It took a long time for this to come to pass. But the judge, whose name was Baudouin, agreed that they had the right to have an assisted death. Yeah. Now, this caused a lot of problems because there were people saying, we have to protect the disabled. We have to protect the vulnerable. But personally, I find that rather insulting because it doesn't mean you still don't have the right to make decisions for yourself. I mean, because you have a physical disability doesn't mean you aren't intelligent, that you don't have agency. And so I found that I was so glad when that happened because it gave Trusha and Gladue the opportunity to actually say, we know what we want. We're entitled to make our decisions. And what happened in the end was that during the pandemic, Jean Trusha, he actually had an assisted death because they got an exemption until the law was changed. So Jean Trusha died with an assisted death, but Nicole Gladue never did. She just held her card. I don't want to be crude here, but it's like a get out of jail free card. You know, she had that card and she said, fine. And she never, ever, ever had an assisted death. She ended yeah. up dying of natural causes, the effects of post polio, which is a terrible disease, but she never used her card. She had won the right to use it. She had won the right to speak and say, I know what I want. I know what my rights are. And yeah. I thought that was so important. And, you know, I want to mention something that I don't like to mention. Joseph Arve was disabled. Yes. He had had a, an accident, a car crash when he was 19 or so. And so he was a paraplegic. That did not stop him from being able to argue this case at the Supreme Court. And who am I? to insult people's intelligence by saying, oh, because you have a physical disability, you don't know what you want or you need or you're entitled to. I just find it so infantilizing and so wrong. I think it's fascinating because, you know, as somebody who has watched legislation and made happen in Canada, I know we Canadians in general thought we might be a little bit closer to what they found in Oregon, which was exactly as you're describing, is that people would apply to die is what happens in Oregon. And they would hold that card close to their chest and find that sense of peace, knowing that they had an out if they need it. But we haven't found that too terribly much. For sure in Ontario, I don't know the stats off the top of my head in other provinces. Why do you think that is? Why do you think we are finding most people are following through with medical assistance and dying instead of using it as that get out of jail card? We have a very different system. We have a medicalized system. And in Oregon, the way it works is that you have to have two doctors agree that you have a terminal illness. You have less than six months to live. And so if that's agreed and you have asked for it and there's a conversation and so on and so forth, you're given a prescription and it's up to you to fill it. No doctor has to be present at your death. Mm. And so I remember being at a conference where I sort of said, can I come, please, please? I'm not an expert, but I am a journalist. Can I come? Anyway, so I was at this conference in Halifax a few years ago and uh, there was an American there. And he was talking about the way we were doing this stuff in Canada. He said, if I had a terminal illness and I had permission, I would just want to do it by myself, close the blinds, you know, just privacy. I wouldn't want a doctor there. Why would I want a doctor there? And I said, look, you 
believe in freedom more than we do. We believe in peace, order, and good government. And that's the difference. And of course, he looked at me as I was like some sort of, you know, you know what he thought I was. Socialist. <laughs> no, a woman. Oh, oh, oh. 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 And, and, socialist. Socialist. <laughs> oh. and then, then there was this <laughs> other person at the table who fortunately was Canadian male. And he said, no, she's right. We do believe in peace, order, and good government. And that's why we want doctors there. We oh. want it to be an official system where we're not doing it on our own. It's like the, not the Wild West to us. It's a very different kind of thing. But that doesn't mean that some people don't actually ask for it. I mean, Nicole Gladue is an example. There are other yeah. people. And I've heard this particularly with people with mental illness, not in Canada, but in other countries like Belgium, for example. I knew one woman who... She was given permission. She had a mental illness. She had definitely had suicidal ideation and for a long, long time, nothing was working. Nothing was working. And so she got permission to die and she never used it or she hadn't used it the last time I heard from her. And that was because, oh, okay, now I know that I, I can get through it now because I know if it gets worse than this, I can have help. And I think that's an important thing to remember with, in terms of agency with people with mental illness. The other thing is we've got to have more supports for them, of course, and we have to have more yes. doctors available. <laughs> that's, you know, another six months of talk. Oh, uh, at least, or a generation, mm. unfortunately, the way we move here in Canada. But that actually linked with kind of my next question, because one of the many statements that you make in the great Literary Review of Canada article where you talk about your experience with right to die activist John Hobbs says, is you talk about being boxed into a death that someone didn't want or need. And I encourage people to read that article to find out the context in which you were speaking about that. But I'm wondering, do you think Canadians themselves are worried that if MAID is now accessible for people where death is not reasonably foreseeable, or if it meets the full potential of the legislation and includes people with mental health as their primary disorder, do you think that there is a right concern that people are going to be boxed into a death that they don't want or need? No, I don't. And the particular thing about John Hofsis was he was a very strange man. He was a right to die activist. He had helped Sue Rodriguez become a household name. He was a marketer in a way. And he had been a film critic at one point, a journalist of sorts, but he was really very helpful to her. He had started a Right to Die Society and it helped Al Purdy die. Al Purdy was the poet, yeah. One of our best poets, yeah. extraordinary person. And he was suffering from a number of diseases. And this was before there was any medical assistance and dying legislation. And he wanted to die. He hadn't made public statements about it. He just wanted to quietly end his life. And John Hoff says offered to help him. So that happened and Al Purdy died. So John Hofsess had this story and he wanted to capitalize on it. And so he tried selling it to everybody in town. And I contacted him when I was in Victoria in 2015. I wanted to interview him and he kept making excuses that he couldn't or he wouldn't or this or that. There were many excuses. Finally, I had to leave. Just before I left, he got in touch with me and he said he just had a terrible diagnosis. He was very, very sick. And then he contacted me again. And the reason he contacted me was he wanted me to write about him. And he would write to me. We exchanged maybe 200 emails, like every day. Oh my gosh, another email from John Hofstadt. <laughs> and he would tell me all sorts of things that I wouldn't tell me. And I sort of kept it to myself. And then he wanted me to go to Switzerland with him. And he wanted the Globe to give him a huge spread to talk about this, that, and the other. It wasn't going to work. And we asked for his health records. And he didn't seem that sick because he sent his medical records. So it just got very complicated. Then he decided that I had betrayed him. And so he actually said to a number of people that I was trying to force him to kill himself, which was not true. 
I mean, the opposite. The mm-hmm. only way he was going to get the headline he wanted was to die. Because he finally persuaded a magazine to publish this story, the Al right. Purdy story. Yeah. And it had a crazy headline. By the time you read this, I'll be dead. I mean, that had nothing to do with me, but it was very difficult. It was very difficult. And one of the things to get back to something I said at the beginning, the day of my book launch, I knew my book was not finished because the legislation had been tabled that day. My concern for the last few months of that book was just getting it published because of the trouble John Hofsess was causing. So I didn't really think enough, I think, in retrospect about saying, can we hold off? Can we hold off? And so I can see what this legislation is like. So in the end, what I did do was when the paperback came out, I asked and was allowed to write another chapter. It's about a 10,000 word chapter on what was wrong with the legislation. So I always feel the paperback is the finished book. But of course, I could write three more, I suppose, because it keeps evolving. But I do think that, of course, it should evolve because we evolve. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have to respect each other. And I've heard this from so many women. I let him die because I loved him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing I think is kind of interesting is so many of the people I've written about are women. Mm-hmm. I think it's because women were so big and the right to have an abortion. And this is the other end. Right to die. It's another human right. Yeah. And we have fought so hard to be able to be part of the birthing process in a way that suits us and aligns with our values and how we want to be in the world. It makes sense that we do the same at the end of life. I think so. Yeah. And in fact, that's one of the things Ellen Weeb says. She was a baby doctor. She was doing abortion activists and so on. So this is the other end. And everybody just assumed, well, the palliative care doctors are going to take care of this, (laughs) which is unfair. And also, they had no intention of doing it. They knew how they managed death. And one of the things that happened because we had legislation is that a lot of palliative care doctors began thinking again. This is legal. This is about patience. This is about choice at end of life. And so for a lot of palliative care doctors, some of them are still not in favor of it at all. And so in some hospitals, some services, what happens is if your patient says, you know, I've had enough, I want this over. And you have the conscientious right to object Mm -hmm. to delivering an assisted death, you move back and another doctor moves yep. forward you with your space. Yep. So that's an important way of accommodating people too, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's tricky right now. And I know one of the things that we are seeing here in Northwestern Ontario with track one and track two, we are seeing a number of our MAID providers move away from providing MAID. And so whereas we had a pretty good number of assessors and providers for our population, we are now quite limited and we have a burgeoning number of people who are requesting. And so that is an area to think of in terms of when it becomes people's right and their opportunity to end their suffering. See, one of the things that I think might be good about the 2021 legislation is if you're in track two, i.e. your death is not reasonably foreseeable, you have to be assessed by an expert in your disease. And maybe that is going to be a way to educate more doctors into how this works and how we could spread it around a bit. Because you're right, there are some doctors who are doing so much and it's not well compensated. And if you are a doctor in private practice, you're basically a small entrepreneur, right? Yeah, absolutely. Salaries to pay, you've got office to pay. So all of this stuff is important. And we can't foresee how having that track too with having to be assessed by a specialist in your area might actually encourage more doctors to understand what it's all about. So that would be good. But right now we've got this terrible problem with needing to revamp the healthcare system Mm 
Yes. Good luck with that. That's right. I, I know. And just as you were speaking, I was thinking of some friends who are disease experts, quotations again, and who say, I want to use my knowledge and my expertise around healing. How is it that I am expected now to provide my expertise for people so that they can die? And I, I think that's a struggle. And that reminds me, you'd mentioned about capturing the headlines earlier. And I, I'm going to ask you a little bit to speak about the role of journalism for medical assistance in dying. And we're seeing some pretty fantastic headlines lately and stories that are coming. And I don't have this one in front of me, but I'm reminded of a man who had said that he was going to request medical assistance in dying because he didn't have the financial means to be able to live in the way that he wanted to be. And so again, this is that boxed in being forced to die when you don't really want to die. And I think somebody did a Kickstarter. Is that the correct term so that people donated money so that this man didn't want to end his life anymore and i worry because as we've said our healthcare system needs revamping our social care systems need revamping how is it that maid fits into those things and don't forget we've got a rapidly aging population exactly and long-term care is such a great place to be, said no Canadians <laughs> post-COVID. I'm not going to that one, but yeah. No, not, but not. okay, so we have these things, right? The thing is, a lot of the stories that get headlines, what's the difference between journalism in a newspaper? Who reads the newspaper anymore? I do, but I don't know how many other people do. <laughs> There's the internet. You can publish anything you like on the internet or on Twitter or Facebook until somebody, you know, you've gone too far and somebody takes it down. But so a lot of these stories that are gathering headlines, Mm -hmm. we would use the word advisedly, don't bear real scrutiny. Absolutely. Pamela Wallen, the Honorable Senator, said that in her keynote at the Right to Die conference, that was one thing that she really took to task, that the loudest voice isn't necessarily the one we're supposed to all be listening to. That's right. And in fact, I went to a conference in 2014 in Chicago, and I met a very important, a significant player at Dignitas in Switzerland. Mm. And he said, we don't want you coming to Switzerland. We want you to do this at home. So he was encouraging me in terms of the beginning of the research I was doing about Canada needed to develop its own system so people Mm. could stay at home and make their decisions. But at that same conference, the conference hotel was kind of invaded by a group trying to protect what they thought were was an attack on the vulnerable, on the physically disabled, that all of these people were going to be just killed. But that's not true. That isn't true at all. And I think it's true of a lot of these headlines where the person who says, I can't afford to, to pay my rent, therefore I want assisted dying. What sensible doctor is going to allow that? Who is going to agree to that? I mean, what might happen, which is a terrible thing, is that maybe that person will die in the shadows because there aren't the social supports. But that isn't that we are allowing people or encouraging doctors to just randomly kill people I believe in transparency. I believe in discussion. I believe in argument. And of course, as a journalist, I believe in the power of narrative. I mean, all of these things are important to me. Yeah. I want to circle back, Sandra. You said that while initially writing about the dead and then writing about the dying, you started to think about your own mortality. You talked earlier about the get out of jail card. Does the legalization of made decrease any of your fears or worries or concerns about your own dying? Sure. I think it does. But what I know is I need a good family doctor. Our system is a good thing. Whether it's the most progressive, I don't I don't know. I mean, it's Canadian. We've worked it through. We're still talking about it. We're doing it little by little. I didn't like the first law. As I said, I admire David Lametti. I think he's right to be cautious about mental illness, but I don't want people who have mental illness to suffer needlessly. And so I think we need to recognize that people have agency. And the other thing is really important is 
we got to fix the healthcare system. Yeah. Yes. Because we can't put the failure of the healthcare system on the backs of medical assistance and dying. Yeah. Agreed. Of that, what you described, made is Canadian in terms of how it's progressing. So, what are your hopes for made in Canada moving forward? Well, I think the Supreme Court decision is incredibly important. And we wouldn't have had that decision if we didn't have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That was the winning argument. Section seven, the right to life, because one of the things that was a problem is that it was not illegal to end your own life. It was illegal to ask for help in ending your life. So if it's illegal to ask for help in ending your life, you've got to end your life when you're capable of doing it. Otherwise, you were breaking the law. So that was the argument that Sue Rodriguez, for example, and all of the people in the Carter decision were being forced to end their lives before they wanted to or felt they needed to because they couldn't have help. And so that was denying their right to life, mm -hmm. which is rather an ingenious argument. You know, people worry about the overreach of the law. But let me tell you something that Joseph Arve said, when parliament refuses to act, the courts must. And mm -hmm. that's what happened. We need to interpret the laws and we need to challenge things that seem unjust. But I really don't think blaming medical assistance and dying is the way to solve the problems in our healthcare system. That's a bigger issue. So we began our conversation, Sandra, talking about obituaries. And so I want to end with obituaries because I love to read obituaries. And I think they not only capture pieces of a story of a person's life, but I think they participate in the context of which somebody is living until they die. And I know I'm noticing that MAID is being mentioned with more frequency in obituaries. And in the research that Carrie Lynn and I have done, we heard people talk about the stigma that's attached to medical assistance and dying still. And so I'm wondering, are you seeing changes in obituaries? Do you think obituaries have a role in destigmatizing medical assistance and dying? Well, I think that I'd like to distinguish between two things. Death notices, which is what I call death notices, yes. are the announcements that family, friends buy space in, say, the newspaper to right. publish. Yes. Or they publish online. And I would advise all of us to write our own death notice. Leave out the stuff you don't want. <laughs> <laughs> you know, say what you want. It's about your life. So don't leave it to... You know, I mean, oh, don't leave it to daughter Susie or somebody who can't remember <laughs> when you got married or whether you got married or whatever. No, put the stuff in you want. But an obituary is a piece of journalism. And <clears throat> so I know lots of times I would be talking to somebody and I'd say, may I speak with your mother? Oh, no, no, she's too upset. She's too upset. And I said, well, I would actually like to ask her about how she met your father who's recently deceased. Oh, I don't know. But you know, that's a different story. That's a good story. Mm. So what I've been noticing with death notices is there is still a stigma because there are certain code words. Mm -hmm. He died at a time of his choosing, choosing. as he wished, surrounded by family, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's time to stop that. Mm. But it's not up to me because this is a family, friends placed and paid for. They're not inexpensive. No. But in terms of actually writing obituaries, there's a lot of squeamishness among some journalists too. They don't actually get, this is not a eulogy. This mm. is something else. Mm. This is life with its shadow and its light. And you're trying to put it in a context of the time. So I... Um, I do think obituaries are really important and I think death notices are too. And I advise you, write it yourself and make sure they know where it is and where are you going to go? Like, are you going to end up in a urn on somebody's dresser for 20 years? I mean, what are you going to do? Those are <laughs> things that we all need to decide. Yeah. 
Now, one of the things that we haven't talked about, which is maybe not relevant, but I'll just say it quickly. I didn't talk about dementia. It's the people on the ground who are caring for their parents, their, their loved ones, their spouses, and so on, versus the children and the siblings who come rushing in. Oh, do everything for mom. Do everything for mom. That's got to stop. That's got to change. I mean, people have to be more understanding of do everything for mom. You know, it's it's so hard. I mean, I remember that was my father and my one of my sisters who was still at home. I still remember we would swoop in and my father would say, oh, sit and have a drink with me. My, my, my sister was making dinner, you know, share the burden because it's so much work. And with a rapidly aging population, yeah. this is a big deal. You know this better than I probably. I don't know about better, but we used to call family members like what you're seagulls. describing as seagulls they fly on in and shit all over the shit. place <laughs> i think what's really important to think about too is what do we mean by everything what does everything mean i can remember having a chat with my 93 year old grandfather who refused to have a dnr he said you gotta do it all you gotta you gotta come in and bring me back and i said to him as gently as i could your bones are such that even the act of CPR would probably cause irreparable pain and damage. Just as Atul Gawande says, we were thinking like family instead of like doctors. When we continue to think like family, of course, when we rush into a room and say, you've got to do it all, all the heroic measures, without the understanding that everything could mean controlling pain and letting somebody make an informed choice about when they would like to go what we're thinking about is our loss totally yes. instead yeah. of their suffering i think that's what it's all about totally and it's a shock when you see your parent who's suddenly totally. deteriorated yeah absolutely i think we go back to that being led with an open heart but understanding that the heart is going to have to make space for the things that make the most sense for the dying rather than those left behind. And that's something that Kathy and I experience quite regularly when we speak to people whose loved people and family members have chosen made is that they have a peacefulness about their grief because they get to sit with the idea that their person made a choice that they wanted to make. Right. And there's, openness about it and two things I want to say is when my mother died which is like decades ago <laughs> it's crazy but she lives in my mind she's like an owl hooting in the trees or something she's there and so I just kind of know her better now than the way I did when I was young I mean because I've gone through some of the same life stages she has but also at the funeral people would come up and tell you stories about this person you knew so well and that is an extraordinary thing because you see a much rounder mm. view of the person you've just lost. Oh, Sandra, thank you. I have so enjoyed this. Yes, thank you. I enjoyed it too. Thank you very much. I look much. forward to the next time we have a chance to chat. Oh, yeah. She is fabulous. Isn't she? Yeah. Not only do I want to listen to her, I just want to have dinner with her. Oh, I have to say, for me, I wanted to pour a large glass of red wine and right. kick back and get to all the things. When I think about Sandra and the time we've just spent with her, I think of her as a story receptacle where people want to, to sort of slot their stories into her care yeah. and for her to then use that narrative to tell that story. I get the sense that she'll honor the story warts and all. Yes. And I yeah. love that. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And the other piece that really resonated with me is when she talks about medical assistance and dying being Canadian. Yep. Although sometimes it feels like the legislation has moved really quickly. I think about one of the first Gallup polls that was done in 1971 asking Canadians, did they want to have something like assisted dying in place? And even back then, 70 to 80 percent of Canadians wanted that. So it hasn't been fast. And we are being thoughtful in some ways about how it moves forward. And 
I appreciate it again what she said. Does our concern or fears outrank the suffering of individuals? Right. But the other thing too, to go back to what you said about made being essentially Canadian is I really started to understand here's a journalist who's traveled extensively to countries where assisted dying, we'll call it, is a practice and has been a practice. And here I am as a Canadian thinking that the world is watching us as our legislation evolves, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And how arrogant that thought is in the sense that I thought we were sort of setting precedents and we are to a certain degree. But I think listening to Sandra, I have to also take on board that we're not the only horse in the race, right? <laughs> and no. and that I think it's really important to really consider what else is out there because I think we can get very insular about these kinds of things. Really interesting. I think there's so much being said there. And I think we're talking about the contextual nature of writing and how we look at things. I think that's really important. I love the way she was talking about the death of her mother in 82, but that she still hears the hooting call of her mom um, yeah. And perhaps knows her mom better. And, yeah. you know, perhaps the past is always a story and that story gets illuminated and it evolves and it perhaps becomes malleable as we grow. I mean, if we're lucky enough to grow old, old yeah. and older. And as she said, into the spaces where she is now having life experiences that her mother would have had. So I, so totally. much there, so many layers there. Just, yeah, yeah. And so on our website, people will be able to find links to some of the articles that we've talked about. Of course, if you want to get the paperback copy of the updated version That's of right. A Good Death, we will link to that as well. And I suspect that we're probably going to have to invite Sandra back again because she's got way more stories for Oh, us. definitely. I know she balked at the thought of a second book, but she did say oh. still writing. And I get the sense that she's going to be still speaking. So we need to check in with her as we move forward into 2023. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, let's keep those conversations coming.